So chapter 430, the final chapter of MHA came out and uh, I'm not crying, you are. It's a terrible day for rain. No, I don't care that I'm inside. One of the greatest manga stories ever told, certainly the greatest superhero high school story ever told, has come to its conclusion. And its ending is a legitimate roller coaster. In this chapter, we get everything from seeing the new generation of up and coming heroes, a really old All Might, and the class 1A all grown up. Yes, that's right, ladies and gentlemen, this is the definitive end of this story. And it features an eight year time skip. This chapter wraps up any lingering questions that we had about what was going on in this universe now that's ending. We saw the embers of one for all fade away from Deku. Class 1A rise into their roles as heroes and Deku settle in to his jaw. Yes, that's right, ladies and gentlemen. If you haven't read the chapter yet, buckle up for an emotional roller coaster because this chapter features twists, turns, and fake outs that are all meant to pull at your heartstrings. So with no further ado, let's get into chapter 430 of My Hero Academia Explained. Before we get to explaining anything, guys, please, for me, like the video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you want to see me try to bring real life challenges to the anime world, go ahead and follow my brand new channel, Anime IRL, that I created with Steven He, Chris Barnett, and Danny Mata. But if you just want to see me, but if you just want to see me talking about anime and manga, go ahead and follow my anime podcast, Talk is Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime and manga this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. So, the end is upon us. I have one less thing to talk about on this page. Hey! Because genuinely, I don't know what I'm more upset about. The fact that I can no longer do manga reviews of MHA or the fact that MHA, one of my favorite mangas of all time, is now over. Either way, uh, not, not having a great day. So let's, let's ignore Nick and let's just, let's just move into the chapter. The chapter begins with a blank panel that shows us the words that Deku and Tomura shared at the end of their battle, which are, you've already destroyed it and it'll depend what you guys do with it from now on. Now, this is obviously in reference to when Tomura was fading out of existence and was talking about how he simply wanted to destroy. But Tomura was telling Deku that whether or not it's to be seen if Tomura actually did destroy the world is dependent on what he and the rest of the heroes do with the world that he tried to destroy in the future. We then see that Deku's writing in a notebook, and what he's writing is the narration from the beginning of MHA's manga. However, the narration has changed. As it now reads, and I quote, people are not born equal. Each of us has a different form or shape, but despite all that, we still care for others. And these differences, both internal and external, allow us to run towards other people in search for the point of intersection. Now, this obviously runs counter to what was said in the beginning of the manga, chapter one, where it says people are not born equal. That's the hard truth I learned at age four, but that was my first and last setback. And thus Deku is now very clearly reflected on everything that happened to him over the course of this manga and changed his tune, saying that whether or not we're born the same doesn't matter so long as we're willing to help each other. And it's while Midoriya is writing this that Kota opens the door to the room that he's in. Kota, the kid with the red shoes and the horn hat that Deku saved from muscular. And he says, big bro Midor, I mean Deku sensei, where should we gather for afternoon class? And it's at this point that we see that Deku is wearing a suit and writing in his notebook. And Kota's wearing a UA high uniform. And thus it's revealed that we're now A in the future and B, Deku is a teacher at UA. Deku then tells Kota that the class will be at the USJ building and continues to write in his notebook. As he closes out what he was writing with saying, this is the truth about society I learned when I was 17. That day I heard everybody's voices and it motivates me to this day. If caring for others was the first step towards becoming a hero, then that day everybody became the greatest hero. We then see a montage of everything that happened between the end of the battle against Shigeru Garaki and this current time that we're in. Like Deku coming home with his half-shaved head and smiling at his mother, Inka. All Might helping Grand Torino walk. The students of Class 1A, or I guess now Class 2A, taking exams and partaking in the sports festival. Shoji and Koda shaking hands with a heteromorphic scientist. Aizawa and present Mike in a graveyard, presumably visiting Korogiri, or Shirakumo, I should say. Endeavor being wheeled around by his sidekicks. The students of Class 2A meeting Melissa Shield. Deku and Uchaku walking together through a snowy day with scarves on and Mr. Compress reading the League of Villains book. He's the only one who survived. Well, I think Spinner might still be alive, but I don't think he's doing 
well. And over all of these images, we get a continual narration from Deku, who says, I was able to live a dream that should have been impossible. The story that began when my body moved before I could think has now come to an end with the embers of one for all. And it's at this point that we see the embers of one for all dissipating through Deku's fingers. And as this narration continues, so do the memories. As we see the memories of Ida giving class 2As, and I guess now class 3As graduation speech, Bakugo and Manoma going through the UA graduation tradition of blowing up up the stage and the narration from Deku continuing by saying do you want to know why I'm still writing well because there's still pages left we then either go an additional eight years into the future or it's just simply being revealed that we are eight years in the future I think it's the second one and we're brought to a random classroom and that classroom is that of Dai's now for those of you who don't remember who Dai is yeah can't say I blame you he was a child who was a fan of Endeavor and had an Endeavor plushy and shiny hair with white circles on it. Yeah, for some reason, the last chapter of the epilogue is focusing on him. And it's in this classroom that Dai's teacher is asking all the kids in Dai's class what they want to be when they're grown up. And one of them who looks vaguely like Manoma and seems to have the disposition of Manoma screams out about how he wants to become a hero. Another girl says that she wants to work in Hatsume's lab. Hatsume is the girl with the zoom eye quirk who was always making Deku a bunch of support items. Another student says that she wants to work in Dr. Yoshida's lab. Dr. Yoshida is like the Yoshi looking guy. We're really running through the cavalcade of characters that don't really mean anything in this chapter. And to round off that list, we have a heteromorphic, I believe, fox girl who says she wants to work at Labrava's company. And we see with Labrava is gentle criminal. So they're together and out of jail. However, Dai doesn't answer out loud to this question. And instead on his paper, he writes that he wants to become a hero. And the character who yelled out about how they're going to become a hero sees this. And he decides that now is the perfect opportunity to tell Dai that he could never become a hero with this quirk. Which, when it gets revealed a little bit later what Dai's quirk is, <laughs> I mean, I'm not not on his side. Kid then goes on to tell Dai that there's fewer villains nowadays, and therefore the amount of heroes necessary has gone down drastically. And therefore, when it really comes down to it, that only the strongest kids have chances at becoming heroes nowadays. Which is kind of a subliminal way of telling us that the defeat of All for One has stabilized hero society. Now, obviously, this doesn't sit super well with Dai, and it makes him upset. And after school, while he's walking home by himself, he thinks to himself that people have changed. See, when Dai was a kid, he remembers that everybody wanted to be a hero. Everybody wanted to be All Might, or Endeavor, or Best Genius, or Deku, or Bakugo. And he feels as though, because he's the only person left who wants to be a hero, that he's acting like a child. And because he's feeling insecure about his want to become a hero, he goes to the All Might statue. And as he gazes upon the All Might statue, we cut to Shoji. Who they are? made hot? Listen, I get that he's got four arms and he can technically do whatever he wants with his arms, but the shoulders they put on this dude? They made Shoji built like an NFL linebacker, maybe even bigger. Dude's built like Prime All Might with double the arms. And they gave him a kind of cool jagged ponytail. It looks sick. He looks good. But outside of the fact that Shoji looks hot, we see him receiving the Imamura Award for his efforts to resolve prejudice-based incidents in a peaceful manner. Basically, he's a social justice activist. And as he's receiving this award, presumably for his work in DC stigmatizing heteromorphs, he gives thanks to the heteromorphs who marched on the hospital eight years ago, which confirms that the time skip has only been eight years, and how without their efforts and their voices being lifted up towards the heavens about how they're sick of being repressed in regular society, that he wouldn't be standing where he's standing today. Next, we see Ida, Tsuyu, Uchaku, and Momo, or Ingenium, Froppy, Creati, and Uravity, traveling to schools all across the country. And the reason they're traveling to schools all across the country is because of Uraka's quirk counseling program. A program that Araka pushed to get instilled in all schools to make sure that people's quirks weren't weighing on their mental health. But Nick, why would she do this? What does this have to do with Uraka? Well, as we know from chapter 429, the battle against Toga weighed very heavy on Uraka, and thus she blames herself for Toga's death, something that Deku had to help her work through. And thus it appears as though she's trying to make sure that nobody in Japan ever goes through a similar situation to Toga, where they're given a quirk that makes them different than how society wants them to be, and they have nobody to counsel them and help them work through this abnormal normality in a way that's healthy and thus these four heroes are traveling from school to school to make sure that their court counseling program is working correctly and it's revealed that this program instilled in schools nationwide is one of the most important programs in all of modern society and that makes a lot of sense when you think about it and could be applied to the real world it's almost as if if we had counseling systems instilled on a nationwide basis we wouldn't have to worry about the rise of 
villains, I'll call it, to keep it thinly veiled. It's almost as if these villains, like Toga, had somebody to talk to, they wouldn't have to reach into their backpack to get their AR-50, I mean their knives, to, to join the League of vi Villains. That's, yeah, that's what we're talking about. After it's revealed what these four essential Class A heroes are up to, we see Aerie with her friends going to a music club. And the important takeaway here is that Aerie is a happy high schooler who has friends and is now apparently a guitar player. And, oh yeah, she got her horn back, and therefore her cutting off her horn and jabbing it into Deku so Deku could regrow his arms didn't really have any consequences, at least not to her, as the growth of her horn implies that she still has her rewind quirk. We then cut to Aizawa and Deku, and Aizawa, who got a haircut that I'm not a huge fan of, is showing Deku a video of Bakugo yelling at a fan who's videotaping him too closely. Aizawa is telling Deku about how if Bakugo keeps acting like this, then Shoto is going to pass him in the rankings, implying that currently Bakugo is ahead of Shoto in the rankings. And we know from chapter 429 that the hero rankings are still very much a part of hero society today as hawks made sure to keep them instilled but also to include regular people who undergo heroic acts that aren't truly registered heroes we then hear about shoto who apparently patrols day and night and treats his fans very well we also hear about how hardly anybody ever refers to him as endeavor's son anymore to which deku responds by saying that he'll pass kamui woods mount lady and maybe even mirko soon in the rankings now the way that deku says even mirko makes me believe that mirko is probably the number one hero right now as after all hawks endeavor and all my impossibly best genus aren't really in the photo anymore as heroes because while best genus was active in the war arc he was also incredibly injured in both the war arc and previously to the war arc and it's not like mirko wasn't incredibly injured she lost the leg and an arm but she didn't seem to care about that. Best Genus did seem to care, though. Aizawa then decides to make the conversation substantially more dour, as he asks Deku if he feels lonely. And he replies that after seeing the conversation between Aizawa and Fuwa, Fuwa's that girl with pink hair who was in the grade above Class 1A. It was revealed in Chapter 425 that Aizawa was her homeroom teacher her first year. Anyways, while listening to that conversation, Deku had a realization. A realization that even without a quirk, he could use his knowledge and experience to help others become heroes. And he thinks that's a pretty cool way to live. And when he Consider the fact that the two heroes that we interface with the most at UA are Aizawa, who basically no longer has a quirk, and All Might, who no longer has a quirk, then yeah, this kind of makes sense as a path to choose in life. It's at this point that Deku asks if Aizawa agrees, and if anybody should agree, it should be Aizawa who's in the exact same situation. But Aizawa doesn't agree and simply says that Deku should be stricter with his students, as most students who enter UA nowadays believe they have a shoe in to become big wig heroes. Therefore, Deku should be more strict to knock them down a peg. Deku then talks about how he's barely seen his friends since graduation, since their days off rarely coincide. And if that's not sad enough, we then see Deku walking home alone. And we see Deku walk past a statue of Class 1A. We see him walk past the poster of Tokoyami, and we see Kirishima on a TV. And while Deku is watching his high school friend be a TV superstar, two kids run past Deku, with one of them screaming, I'm unbreakable! Which is obviously a reference to Kirishima, who is now apparently a movie or TV star with his hardening quirk. However, as the two kids are running, one of them trips, and Deku, immediately without thinking, rushes in and catches him. And we see a flashback to the moment that started Deku's hero's journey when he dove in to help Bakugo without thinking about himself. However, as Deku catches the child, he realizes as he looks up that Dai had also jumped to save the child, but had come up substantially short. And now to this point that Dai and Deku get up and send the children on their way, and Dai begins to tell Deku who he immediately recognizes about his insecurities, most specifically about how he wants to become a hero, how he believes that his want is childish, and how he comes to the All Might statue whenever he's feeling down. And it's at this point that Dai asks Deku, do you believe I can become a hero? like All Might and you. And this makes Deku think about the very same question that he asked All Might. It's at this point that Deku begins to analyze Dai's quirk, which is revealed to be the ability to pull plates, yes, like dinner plates out of his hair. His quirk is setting the table. It's Monoma with no practicality outside of skeet shooting. And yet Deku, being the superhero that he is, says yes. Of course, it's my time now to give people hopes and dreams like All Might did for me. And therefore, he says that Dai will absolutely become a superhero because he dove to save the child in the same way that Deku did. And as he's telling Dai this, we see the camera pan out. And we see that now, alongside the All Might statue with his fist in the air, are a bunch of civilians crowded around All Might as statues with their fists in the air. To symbolize that while All Might was the symbol of peace, true peace is maintained by every Deku then tells Dai to do his best. Deku then thinks to himself, if I said I'm not a little sad, I'd be lying. However, I can at least encourage other people like that. And that's the story 
of how we all become great heroes. And just like that, the MHA manga comes to an end, with Deku as powerless as the day he began his story, now committed on a similar path to All Might and Aizawa, quirkless but willing to teach, using his knowledge and experience to guide the new generation of wannabe heroes who may not have been given the best genetic roll of the dice in their path to becoming the greatest here. Just kidding, the story's not actually over. Cause an old ass All Might grabs the end card of the manga, rips it off the panel and crumples it up. It's at this point that a very old All Might apologizes for the delay, but he's apologizing to Deku, who's telling him he could have just picked him up at the airport. But All Might says, it's fine. I wanted to give you a surprise gift. All Might tells Deku that the battle that he had against All For One eight years ago opened up infinite possibilities in the support item world, as he tells Deku that technology, just like quirks, always evolves. And while All Might is saying all of this, he produces a briefcase, and he hands it to Deku, who says this must have cost a lot. But All Might says it was developed by a friend in the US, who is presumably either Melissa or David Shields from the second? The first? Either the second or the first My Hero movie. I'm pretty sure it's the first. But on top of being produced by a friend from the US who's definitely one of the shields, it was also produced by Hatsume and funded by Class 1A alumni, most notably Bakugo. And thus the shields, Hatsume and Class 1A all pitched in to give Deku a support item similar to that that which All Might used in his battle against All For One, the Benjamin Button All For One. And it's at this point that All Might says to Deku, Take this to heart, kid. You've earned this power, fair and square. And as Deku smiles upon receiving the suitcase, we see Bakugo yelling at him, saying, come on, Deku. Hawks was informed about a landslide on a highway, and he's called for some heroes to solve it. And at this point, the Deku opens the support item and jumps to go help Bakugo. But as he flies off with Bakugo, using the new power of this brand new and advanced support item that's even better than the one All Might used, he looks back and he sees Shigaraki's ghost. The final double spread of this 430 chapter manga being class 1A, all grown up, on their way to work together. And the entirety of the class is there, Ioma included. And after eight years, they're finally reunited. And with that, that's how MHA truly comes to an end, with Deku as a support item hero. And considering what All Might was able to accomplish in his battle against Benjamin Button All For One, an enemy way stronger than Deku will bump into nowadays, there's no reason for us to believe that Deku is any weaker than he was when he last had powers. But we'll never know. All we do know is that he's with his friends. And genuinely, when you think about MHA as a manga, that's all that really matters. And with that being the final panel of MHA, that means that we never saw Deku's dad. Did we hear we were gonna see him? Yep. Did he ever show up? Nope. Which means me and Deku got two things in common. Deadbeat father, no quirks. This has truly been our hero academia. But when it comes to endings, I genuinely have no qualms with this one. While yes, when Deku lost his arms, I wanted him to lose his arms forever. Ever since that moment, I've genuinely believed everything that Horikoshi has done with this manga has been the correct move. One for all and all for one should be extinguished simultaneously. They were created to oppose each other. Well, more specifically, one for all was created to oppose all for one. And thus Deku flying around with one for all and possibly passing it on to somebody down the line just didn't make sense. I also like that in chapter 429, Deku used the last of his ember to save Uchaku. And while it's not necessarily confirmed that she was going to throw herself off that ledge that she was on, I am happy he used the last remnants of his ember to be there with her. And while I could have accepted Deku being a quirkless teacher who was guiding the next generation of students into herodom, for him to be doing that while the rest of his friends were out being heroes just didn't sit super right with me. And Horikushi knew that, that's why he did a psych out. So Deku and all of his mid-twenties friends all getting to be heroes together once again does make my heart smile. So really, when it comes down to it, while the manga was far from perfect, my god, what an ending. But I'm curious to hear from you guys. If you could have written MHA to end in any way, how would it have ended? Tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. The Weeb Commander MHA Manga Reviews, signing off. <laughs>